Well, welcome back, guys. Uh, not sure what week we're on. Um, I want to say it's week nine. Today, we're talking about bad doctrine. We got three that we're going to go through today. And um, we're going to use scripture to prove all things. And um, today, we'll, we will be addressing the immaculate conception or deception. By the end of this conversation, you might be calling it. We're going to be talking about tithing today, and we're going to be talking about the rapture. We're going to be addressing these things from a scriptural perspective, proving all things with scripture, right? And so I'm going to go where I always go to start these conversations to lay the backdrop concerning why we use scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. And for most of you, this will be pretty much a tradition at this point, because I, I tend to start these off in the same place every week, right? All right, here we go. Second Timothy 3.16 reads, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so we know scripture tells us not to lean on our own understanding. We know scripture tells us to prove all things, study to show ourselves approved. We know that God's word is infallible and covers all things and we simply need to seek truth through examining his word via the old testament as well as the new testament in order to one prove all things and to have those things witnessed through other scriptures all right and so we know that uh second timothy three seventeen that a man of god be made perfect we know perfect in hebrew means made whole and complete not in need of anything right so we have these scriptures in order to go through the process through practicing righteousness, through uh, applying God's instruction in order to be made whole and complete, not in need of anything, to be fully furnished unto all good works. So scripture is a tool that God gave us in order to be fully equipped according to what God placed us here to do in the earth. Right. And so today we'll be using scripture to address these three topics. The one that I think is the most interesting um, to start with, and that would be tithing. Now, let me lay a backdrop real quick. We black folk, most of us came up in church. Uh, most of us had traditions that we were basically uh, given. Your children, you grew up in your parents' household, you know, if you if you if it's Sunday, you wearing Sunday's best, you in church as kids, whether we were in full assembly or whether our church had the children's ministry where they're playing music and the whole nine. That's where you are on Sunday. Right. And one thing that. Most of us, if not all of us, can tell you that we learned in church is that you tithe 10 percent. 10 percent of your paycheck. You know, we're told, oh, sow seeds. You sow seeds and God will add an increase. I remember being a kid and getting $100 for my birthday. And I put $10 in it. Like, yeah, if I, if I put this $10 in, God going to increase that 100 So I, I have 90 but I'm going to end up with more because I'm sowing a seed. I remember thinking that because of what I was taught as a kid, right? Then you hear... You see, the only scripture that anyone ever uses in the in the church out of Malachi, will a man rob God? We all know that scripture. We might not know anything else about Malachi other than a man shouldn't rob God, because that scripture is always cherry picked out of Malachi to convict you to make sure you're paying money in church. Right. And so um, what does scripture say? Though? What does scripture say and what does scripture say in full context? Well, today we're going to go through the scriptures centered around tithing first. And we're going to move through this pretty quickly because there's a lot to cover today across these three topics. Um, you're going to find that we're going to a lot of books and passages that you are not typically presented. And I'm talking about in the 66 book Bible. Now, we're going to go to some of the lost records today to reaffirm these things. But I am deliberately proving things using the 66 book Bible first so that without a shadow of a doubt, you can see very clearly in the 66 book Bible that um, you can prove all things 
according to God's will. And then you're going to see as we add the lost records to it, not only do they affirm the 66 books, but they give you great detail for you to understand why they might have been removed in the first place. All right. So the story, the topic is tithing. And we're going to go to Leviticus um, in the Old Testament, the books of the law, um, to start to lay a backdrop for what tithing actually is. Let's go to Leviticus 27 and 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And if a man will eat all redeemed ought of his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. All right, so let's look at this. First and foremost, do you see money anywhere in this? And some would make the argument, well, well, they, they didn't have dollar bills back then. Yeah, but they had a form of currency. We're going to prove that. We're going to prove that during this time they actually had a form of currency. And that what we're showing here is the preferred norm where it concerns tithes. First and foremost, and all the tithe of the land. The land, right? The tithe of what grows out of the earth, the land whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the land belongs to the Lord. So very clearly, whatever, whatever the amount of this tithe, we will prove it to be according to scripture. We know that it's referring to land and what is grown or cultivated on it. And it's some portion of that that belongs to the Lord. Let's, let's continue this. We're going to jump to Deuteronomy 14. 22 through 27. And the amount of things that you can establish according, God, according to God's appointment, his instruction, and his will with just Leviticus and Deuteronomy. There's at least 50 things that you can establish just reading those two books to the point that when you're having a conversation with someone about the Bible, you will know immediately if they've read the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy almost immediately because most things can be proved with just those two books alone. All right, so you shall truly tithe all the increase of your seed that the field bring forth year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place which he choose to place his name there. The tithe of the corn, of the wine, and of your oil, and the firstlings of your herds, and of the flock. And you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. So now we're getting more involved with when it was addressed in Leviticus, tithing of the land, what all that pertaineth to, right? Recapping, tithing of your corn, your wine, your oil, like you're pressing oil from, from things, your firstlings of your herd and of your flock. So, so far you haven't seen money yet, right? We haven't seen money yet. Money's here, but we're not to that part yet. We're, we're, going, we're, going to, we're going to pick that up. All right. Continuing on, this is 24. And if the way be too long for you so that you are not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from you, which the Lord your God should choose to set his name there, when the Lord your God have blessed thee, then shall you turn it into money. Turn it into money, continuing on, and bind up the money in your hand and shall go unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose. Now, pause. A couple things. Number one, God wants you to take your tithe from your cattle, from your crops, from all the stuff in the earth that you have grown, right? He wants you to take it to a location. We have not determined the location yet. We're going to go there in a second. However, Money is mentioned in two places. If your 10% of increase of these things in the land is too much for you to transport to this location that we have not yet surfaced, then at that point, do you convert it into money, right? Now, let's go back, let's go back to Leviticus 27 and 31 to show you that again in, a, in another languaging. 
We're going back to Leviticus 27 and 31. And it reads, And if a man will at all redeem ought his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. Now, redeem. We're going to look that up in the Hebrew real quick. So redeem, when you look through it, to redeem, act as a kinsman, avenger, revenge, ransom, do part of a kinsman, right? To redeem by payment, to redeem with God subject, right? Payment. So to redeem, the second definition to redeem by payment. This means to convert into money. So going back to what we just read in Deuteronomy, if you are taking your the 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 increase of the land and you are redeeming it, you are converting it into a currency according to what we read in Deuteronomy. Content, we're going to jump back to Deuteronomy 14 and we'll pick up where we left off and we'll deliberately reread that verse to connect it to redeeming, to redeem what has grown out the earth as a tithe for the most high, right? And if the way be too long for thee, so that you are not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from you, which the Lord your God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord your God has blessed you, then you should turn it into money. You should redeem it, right? And bind up money in your hand and go into the place which the Lord God shall choose. Continuing on. And you shall bestow that money for whatsoever your soul lusteth after. Now, this isn't lust in a, in a sinful sense. This is more so inferring desire inside of righteousness. This whole construct is addressed to righteous people. So the idea is the desires of the righteous, right? So whatever your soul lusteth after for oxen, for sheep, for wine, for strong drink, or for whatsoever your soul desire, and you shall eat there, there before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice you and your household. Where's pastor in this so far? Where's pastor? Where's church so far? Have you seen it yet? Have you seen take your paycheck and, and give 10% to your pastor yet? Have you seen that yet? We're, we're going to continue on. But I, I, I'm just, I'm painting a picture so far, right? Now, watch this, 27, continuing on. And the Levite that is within your gates, you shall not forsake him, for he have no part nor inheritance with you. So, inheritance, what are we talking about here? All the tribes of Israel, for the exception of Levi, had the ability, they had a piece of land that was, set, that was given unto them so that they could set up shop, set up their families, start to work the land in order to produce food out of it in order to take care of their families. Each tribe of Israel had an inheritance in order to do this, in order to sustain themselves, right? Levi didn't have an inheritance for that reason. Levi was God's portion. Levi did not have the, the job of farming the land in order to produce food. So Levi had no means to be able to feed themselves. Why? Because the Most High had other work for them. Their work was to do the atonements as needed, preserve the record of our people, teach our people and educate our people, and adjudicate sin and the affairs of men in order to be the judges, in order to uh, 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 rightfully divide truth amongst the affairs of men, right? And to be the, the liaison between the Most High and the kings of Israel in order to to give instruction to the kings because the kings couldn't hear from God directly. The kings heard from God through his elect, his inheritance, Levi. So how are they going to eat? How are they going to eat if they didn't have the time or the situation to grow food? This is what tithes were for. This is why food, as we've talked so far, was stored in the storehouse in order for Levi to be able to be sustained in order to do their work, right? So, so far we have been able to, to ascertain that God said there's, there's a portion in the earth that's his inheritance. It's grown out the ground or cultivated on the ground, whether it be cattle or crops, right? We're supposed to take it. We're supposed to take a, a portion of it to this location, which we have not yet established. 
in order to ultimately celebrate our, our obedience and commune with the Most High, right? And to make sure that we're feeding Levi in the process, right? But we still don't know what this location is yet. Because it also mentions that if it's too far for you, convert it, redeem it into money, then go into that land and buy the things that you would want to feast with and then commune with the Most High and feast in that land. Let's find out where this location that the Most High placed his name on the land is. We're going to go to Second Chronicles 6 and 6. We're using scripture to determine the land that God's name was placed on where it concerns where to take these tithes, right? But I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there and have chosen David to be over my people, Israel. So here's the location. So we're, if we're not Levi, we're growing food. We have cattle. We're taking a portion, 10%. We're taking it to Jerusalem. If we're a block over, it shouldn't be too hard. If we're further away, like someone who was on the other side of the river, might be a little difficult to move your 10% of your increase, cattle and otherwise. They didn't have cars back then, obviously, right? So you liquidate your 10%. You commute over to Jerusalem. You purchase things in the city and you commune with the most high by feeding your family and feeding Levites, right? This is tithing thus far, according to Leviticus, All right? So let's, let's add to this. We're going to add more to this. Let's jump to Deuteronomy 14 and 28. At the end of three years, you shall bring forth all the tithe of your increase the same year and shall lay it up within your gates. And the Levite, because he have no part of inheritance with you and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow, which are within your gates, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand, which you do. Levites, not pastors, not church, Levites. Stranger fatherless, widow, God will use you to benefit his people. If God places a blessing on you, it's not for you to go out here and buy Lear jets and helicopters. It's for you to feed his people. And through blessing and feeding his people, that is a form of ministry to say, hey, I know you're downtrodden. I know you're going through things, but God loves you. God's going to use his people who are blessed through their, through the example of obedience to pour into those who don't have so that they can get to a point where they can be like those that are blessing them, right? So in this particular situation, every three years, there is a calling or an instruction to then take your tithe on that third year and, and open up your gates to allow strangers and fatherless and widows to eat, right? And Levi. Now, we're going to add more increase to this. Let's jump to Nehemiah 10, 35, and 36. Nehemiah 10, 35, and 36. And to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all of the trees year by year unto the house of the Lord. Now, we know where the house of the Lord is because we just went to a scripture that showed us that the Most High placed his name on the land of Jerusalem. So this is where the house of the Lord is at this time, right? Also, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstlings of our herds and of our flocks to bring to the house of God unto the priests that minister in the house of God. So this was a whole, this was a whole vibe. This was a whole tradition. Year, year in and year out. It just so happened on the third year, you would open your gates to more people, but ultimately your tithes were, were, were for you because of your obedience and for those who would, would benefit because they were in need, right? Now we're going to go to the scripture that's, that's cherry picked out of context and abused in institutions to convict you to put money into the institution using a scripture that doesn't even represent that. And I'm certain all of you have heard this scripture in a partial context, 
for those who have not read the entire the entire book of Malachi, right? And I and I and I need you to consider this. I wouldn't even tell you to take my word with these things. I would always tell you to go behind me and check. But ultimately, people being able to abuse scripture is predicated on you not going behind these churches and reading the Bible for yourself. It is imperative that all of us study to show ourselves approved. Go behind me. Don't I'm, I'm a man. I, I didn't write this. You should be you should be checking for yourself behind me to prove all things with scripture. Right. And so Malachi three and eight through ten. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, where have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? You are cursed with a curse for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. So they use this scripture to say, see. Will a man rob God? Don't don't keep money out of his church. You better reach into your pockets and give me 10 percent of what you make. Let's go to the beginning of this book to see the context. So we know, number one, who God is addressing and what it is he's talking about. We know it's not. So far, we know it's not money. We know nine times out of 10 it's not money. Right. So. Malachi, chapter one, we're going to verse 12 through 14. And this is God talking to Israel. FYI. God's a little bit irritated at this point. Because color folk think they slick and the most high is calling them out on it. Right. So but you have profaned it in that you say the table of the Lord is polluted and the fruit thereof, even his meat is contemptible. Right. You said also, behold, what a weariness it is. And you have snuffed at it. So the people are huffing and puffing now that they have to do these things, despite the Lord, their God being the reason why they're actually in the situation they're in. Right. Say of the Lord of hosts and you brought that which was torn and the lame and the sick. So God said, I told you to give me the best of your flock. You giving me some old bootleg uh, animals, the ones you ain't want. You keeping the best of your flock for yourself. And you come to me kind of like uh, Cain back in the day. You coming to me with the inferior of your flock in the inferior of, of your land. So continuing on, right? And you have brought that which was torn and the lame and the sick. Thus you brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord, but cursed be the deceiver. So you thank you slick going behind my back, trying to bring me something that is less than your best. Like I can't see everything, right? Which have in his flock a male and boweth and sacrifice unto the Lord a corrupt thing. So you sit here claiming that these are your best and you know better, right? For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful amongst the heathen. So this is what is meant when it is re referring to people trying to rob God. These ain't churches we're talking about. The, this is a time where, according to the instruction that we just established, men started to try to do something a little different. Like God wouldn't catch it, right? Any questions so far? No question, but bro, I just have a comment, dog. Like, being in the Word for years, I've never got this much context. I've gotten context. Um, because in my mind, America is the only place where we think meat means money. <laughs> sure. And, but, but the robbing God part, this scripture in Malachi one gives so much context. Cause I never really understood when he said, will a man rob God? I was like, man, like, what is, what does that mean? Like, so if I don't get my times, I'm robbing God. So this, I just want to, it's not a question, but just a comment. Like this gives so much context to the robbery statement. Absolutely. And, and Don, to your point, man, like this is actually calling out them churches that are using this scripture out of context because low key, that's sort of like robbery, too. If you know that you were given your appointment. To be able to uh, 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 help those in need, the widows and the fatherless and these people that are going through things and the people that are giving you the times, how is it? That you in a uh, uh, um, 
a righteous heart, you okay with seeing your congregation suffer, but you flying off in jets. You got limos and all these high-end cars. And a lot of people will be like, well, it's not for me to say what um what uh you know God is giving them. Yeah, but it is to say when they're using scripture out of context. We're not yeah. supposed to be doing that. So if scripture is being used out of context in order for them to inherit all of these things, it's not built on it's not built on proper ground. It's built on scripture being used out of context, right? We're, we're going to add to that though. Um, let's jump to um, the New Testament to show this same thing in the New Testament. We're going to go to Matthew twenty three twenty three. When you see something in the Old Testament, you're going to see it in the New Testament. Typically, because when the two, New Testament was being written, these guys were reading out of the Old Testament. So there shouldn't really be a situation where you can find something that is that was established by the Most High in the Old Testament, and you're not going to be able to find it in the New. In fact, I would much rather prefer the Old and New Testament be called the Establishment Testament and the Witnessing Testament, because functionally, that's how they really operate in tandem. One establishes, Christ came to witness what was established in the Old, right? So Matthew 23, 23, woe unto you. Now, woe translates destruction. So destruction unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Before we even finish this verse, you ain't seen money nowhere in here. So even the Pharisees and the scribes were submitting things from the earth, according to what we just read in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, right? Continuing on. And you have omitted, omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith, those ought you to have done not to leave the other undone. So you're tithing these things, but you're you're not you're more concerned about the traditions, Pharisees, than the other pressing matters of the law. But the point that I wanted to make here is even the Pharisees and Sadducees were holding to that portion of the law where it concerns tithing things out of the earth, right? So let's prove that this was never intended to be changed. Deuteronomy 12 and 32. What things soever I command you, observe to do it, you shall not add thereto, nor diminish from it. So we know God's not a man that he would change his mind. We know that what was established in the Old Testament, God has made provisions in the new, but the establishment himself, he has never changed. Even when we looked at the statues of Moses, he didn't repeal the statues of Moses. His son was sent in order to absorb that so that we don't have to do that portion. But it's still active. It's, it's just covered under what Christ came to do, his blood, right? So there's no scripture that said Christ came to add money or replace his original appointment with money paying to churches as opposed to Levites in other places opposed to Jerusalem. So unless you and I are, you know, a couple blocks down the street from Jerusalem, we're farmers. What is this? Now, I'm not one to say that you shouldn't give to the ministry that uh, uh, is pouring into you. Me personally, people have offered to give me money. Personally, I'm not going to take it because the most high covers me. I'm good. If, if any money is raised for this, we're giving it to someone who needs it. Um, I, in good conscience, I can't do that. I can't in good conscience take money based upon something God gave to me in order to pour into people and use that for myself. Personally, I can't do that. It's a heart conviction thing, but apparently you have people that do. Um, we're going to go to, uh, we're going to go to first Timothy six to see a description of the type of people that do these sort of things that do have the framing that, that money somehow is a measure of, 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 uh, of righteousness somehow directly. First Timothy six, we'll be reading six, three and four. If any man teach otherwise and consider not too wholesome words, even the words of the Lord, Yeshua Christ and to the doctrine, which is according to godliness. Now watch this for he is proud knowing nothing but doubting about questions and strifes of words whereof cometh envy, 
strife, railings, evil surmisings. We're going to look those words up here in the New Testament, first and foremost. So we're in 1 Timothy 6. We're going to go to 4. Doubting questions of strife of words. So for those who may not understand or have looked up strife, strife is in the vein of you're speaking in a manner that creates arguments or division. Strife and variance are like brother and sister. Variance is, is, is contending with one another, but strife is the process by which you do that, right? Whereof cometh envy. We know what envy is. I'll look it up in the Strong's just to show it. Jealousy, detraction, ill will, spite, all right? That's envy, right? We just talked about strife. We'll, we'll, we'll look it up anyway. Contention, contention, wrangling of uncertain affinity, a quarrel, wrangling, debate, variance, right? Railings, slander, detraction, speech to another's good name, evil surmisings. Surmisings are suspicion. So this passage is basically saying he is proud knowing nothing but doubting about questions and strife of words whereof come of jealousy, conflicts, railings. All of these things come from people who have this, this mindset that we're going to continue to read about in five. All right. So five reads perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. So now we know who it's talking about. It's talking about men of corrupt minds, right? People who are what? Going back to what we said what we read previous, if any man teach. So these are teachers who have corrupt minds and the product out of their corrupt minds are these things, right? So, and destitute of truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw yourself. So if you are dealing with teachers that look at gain as though it is godliness, what does that sound like to you guys? Have we have we heard of the prosperity ministry? Prosperity gospel, bro. Yep. <laughs> people who esteem gain as though it's godliness. And these people are of corrupt minds. Continuing on. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. So for anyone who looks at wealth and prosperity as though it's some form of godliness, well, I guess when you die, the godliness leaves with you, huh? Either that or it has nothing to do with godliness. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. So, this whole passage is about priority when it concerns provisioning. And not to make a God of provisioning, right? To be content with what the Most High allows you to have through obedience, right? But they will be rich, fall into temptation and a snare. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. So half the time, God ain't going to let you have but so much. We know the scripture says God's not going to give you a temptation that you cannot handle. The Bible says it's difficult, not impossible. It's difficult for a rich man to reach the kingdom. Why? Why is it difficult? But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. A snare is something that like a bear trap. It, it captures you, right? And into many foolish and hurtful lust. Think about all the things that, that come to mind when you think of people that have a whole lot of money. Think of Floyd Mayweather. Throwing money around. He got a whole entourage. These people would be having bodyguards. They be in the clubs throwing money around, just doing foolish things. You could get run up on and shot up. Who knows? Running around with multiple women. Because, of course, there's a certain brand of woman that's attracted to that. Now you're dealing with fornication and all these other things, right? You, you like, like Raven said, you're, you're, you're bragging. You have a prideful spirit. Can't nobody tell you nothing. You can't be corrected. You ain't reading your Bible. All these things come from this, right? All these things come from this being weaponized against you, right? Which drown men in destruction and perdition. So let me say this real quick before we move on. For any of you who are in industries that there is great wealth to be had and you find that everyone around you seems to have wealth and you don't, you are probably protected from something you ain't had no business in. You were probably protected from something that God knows if you were given that, it would lead you to your destruction. That's a form of grace. And that's something that we all should be thankful of. Now, 
one final scripture because we hear the scripture, but we most often we don't know that everything that we just read is connected to this next scripture, which is for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covet after they have erred the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Y'all remember from the 90s, those that are old enough, more money, more problems. That's, yep. exactly, what we, that's exactly what we're talking about here. <laughs> Just Biggie was biblical. <laughs> <laughs> careful. <laughs> Be careful. Be very careful. In that context. In, in that, that context. In that context. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so it's pretty straightforward when you actually surface these scriptures. Um, I didn't read any of these growing up. These scriptures were not presented to me growing up at all. But having the context, it gives it a little bit more um, clarity. And having read these, if I were to enter one of those institutions, will a man rob God? I would probably in my mind respond at that point. Yeah, I know. Will, will you? Because at this point, we know who is talking about and who is not. Right. But ultimately, David said himself. He has been young and now he is old and he never saw a righteous man forsaken. The idea is we were not placed here to be at our own discretion. Period. We were placed here to rely on the one who placed us here. It was always that. So. When you're in the world and you're convicted to give when when you are in a situation where you're weighing what you have in your pocket, please understand. God can add or take away from you at any time. It's not really if you're convicted to give. Whether it's in a church or otherwise, if you are convicted by the Holy Spirit, not not by them using scripture out of context, but by the Holy Spirit, whether you add a light and you see a man that that looks that's homeless, he's sitting there. It's not really your place to grade whether you think that man is actually uh, uh Need, in need of or not, if you are convicted by the Holy Spirit, follow your convictions because j just as easily as you can give that man is just as easily as God can give to you. It's not yours anyway. All of this is on borrow, on borrow, on loan. Our time here, the things that we are afforded, they're not ours. How many of you have kids? You let them, you give them something and they want to get all possessive over it. And it's like, this ain't even yours. <laughs> what you getting How are you getting possessive with your siblings when I gave this to you? It ain't even yours anyway. And so I wanted to li leave you with that backdrop and that context um, so that when we are dealing in the world, we have the scriptures to back what it actually is. Um, and you are convicted according to what the Bible actually says, because the Holy Spirit is going to bring this back to your remembrance, not some cherry picked rendition that you might have heard somewhere out in the streets. All right. We're going to try to make the next one equally efficient. Now we're going to have a conversation about the rapture. This is one that, you know, our <laughs> a, lot, a lot of our parents still believe in this. Scripture takes care of itself. I don't need to contend with anything. I can just point someone to scripture. And leave it there. And if they want to accept scripture, that's between them and the most high. That has nothing to do with me. All right. So with that backdrop, most of us w was raised to believe Christ is coming back. Scripture says that and states that very clearly crack in the sky. We, we know that scripture. Um, we were taught to believe, you know, Christ, you know, Christ is coming back and no one knows the day and hour. That's scriptural. And, you know. If you're righteous, he's going to beam you out of here. You're going to get beamed out of here. There's going to be people left behind that that didn't make it. You've seen the movies when we were kids. You got planes crashing because pilots got beamed out the plane. You got cars crashing because people were in the car and they just got taken out the car. Babies disappearing. The world's in turmoil. Then then we, we were told that after that, you have this seven-year tribulation period. Here come the mark of the beast and all these things. And the righteous, they're going to be up out of here, so they're not going to experience none of it. You know, you have people going around, oh, all praise the most high. Christ coming back to grab me before all of that happens, right? Then you got a seven-year period where it's going to be harder for you to get in the kingdom. But you basically, 
you're not going to be able to buy and sell goods if you don't take that mark. So you're going to suffer through that seven year period. At the end, you're going to be beheaded. And that's your way. That's your entry into the kingdom. And then Christ come back another time to grab you and, and raise you up into the sky. So so according to what we've been taught, Christ coming back two more times. He's commuting back and forth twice. Right. Does that sound like what most of us have been taught coming up? Something something in that vein, in that in that realm? Yeah. All right. So let's see what scripture says. <laughs> we should be able to prove this with scripture, right? Let's go to Matthew 24. So there's a side point that I want to uh, to make to show you guys in this. Um, and it'll be food for thought for other conversations that you have in the near future. Um, but it is part of this conversation as well. We're going to start at Matthew 24 and 1. We're going to read down to 5. And Yeshua went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him from to show him the buildings of the temple. And Yeshua said to them, see you not all these things. Verily, I say unto you, there shall not be uh, left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And he sat down upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privily saying, tell us. When shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? So something jumped out at me maybe about three months ago when I read this. Holy Spirit came to me and said, the reason that they responded to him saying that the temple would be destroyed by saying, you know, when is the end of the world coming is because according to their their vantage point in that time, the world could not exist without that temple. So in their mind, if the temple was destroyed, that had to be the end of the world. And so that's the context by which they're asking, oh, the temple destroyed? They didn't have a situation in their lifetime where the temple didn't exist. From their perspective, their very connection to God came through the Levites in the temple. So their framing was that there's no temple. We have no connection to the one that gives us all provision and protection. Obviously, that would have to be the end of the world, not knowing and understanding that we're temple of the Most High. That concept had not been established at that time. Food for thought. So continuing on. And Yeshua answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. So in other words, Christ is already warning them up front. There's probably going to be men out here that try to deceive you. He wouldn't have said it otherwise. You know what I'm saying? And so. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So you're going to have many people out here claiming to either be Christ or be followers of Christ that are deceiving many. It doesn't say a few. It says many. And we know in the New Testament, we see remnant a whole lot. And the remnant are always the few that are actually not fooled or deceived. Keep that in mind, right? Verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Six, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So Christ is alluding to the fact that, hey, a whole lot of things are going to occur that you might think is the end, but it's not. And these things have to happen, right? For a nation shall rise against a nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places, right? So Christ is, is giving them foresight to things that have to occur in the future. He, they, ask the, they ask the scary question. He's giving them the scary answers. There's going to be rumors of wars and all kind of chaos happening in the world. But you shouldn't be afraid. But I'm letting you know it's coming so that you can see it as a sign. We're going to jump down to Matthew 24, 36. We're addressing this conversation where it concerns the rapture, Matthew 24, 36. And it reads, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. So Christ said, I don't even know. The angels surely don't know. So I'm giving you a heads up. I, I, I can't answer the timing of it. 37, reading on. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the son of man be. What was happening in the days of Noah? Number one, 
his elect knew the signs. For those who have read Jasher, you know that God shook the foundations of the earth with, with an earthquake the week leading up to the flood. Noah and his sons knew what, what that represented. And to Raven's point, yes, the rest of the world, they were, they ain't, ain't no rain coming. They were deceived. So in that time period, they went on like nothing was going to happen, right? That's what was happening in the days of Noah. Continuing on. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage, sex and all kinds of craziness, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Until that point, right? And knew not until the flood came. So they didn't believe it at all until they actually saw the flood. By that point, it was too late and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the son of man be. So I want you to keep that word took in your mind. Took, taken. Because we're going to see that again here in a couple minutes. So Christ is saying, I don't know what day and hour, but I can tell you what to look out for. I can tell you what you're going to see in the earth. At the time, right before it happens, as a sign, people are going to be acting a fool, not checking for God at all, out here doing whatever they want. It's a sign. I don't know when specifically, but it's going to look very similar to like the times right before the flood came. God said, I would not destroy the earth again with water. Next time it would be with fire. So this is a sign, right? Now Christ is going to give an illustration. Going back to that word took we were just talking about, he's going to give an illustration concerning what we are addressing when it talks about folk being taken, right? 40. Then shall two be in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. I'm going to read that again. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Let's go back to 39. And knew not until the flood and took them all away. 40, then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left behind. So Christ's coming is going to be like in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, they were taken in the flood. So tell me, people, is to be taken a good thing or a bad thing? Jesus is making a comparison. He's basically saying, hey, remember the days of Noah. It's going to be the same thing in, our, in, in the day of the Son of Man. One person, is, you know, because we we all seen or have heard of the, the Left Behind movies back in the day. Of course. Concept of being left behind was a bad thing. Like Jesus is coming back for his children and he's going to leave all the wicked people basically on the earth. If you're left behind, you're going to be mad because you're not going to be the ones. But he, that's not a comparison to Noah, because in the days of Noah, it wasn't the children of God that were taken. It was actually only Noah and his sons that God found righteous. And he said, I'm going to let them stay in the earth. But all of the wicked, because I'm going to take them because the Bible says that God had was sorry that he had made man. Yep. So take them all out. Yep. And, and guess and, what? Mm -hmm. Real quick. And guess what? The kingdom, how the kingdom coming here if you're being taken away from here? Scripture says the kingdom is coming here. How is it coming here? If you're being taken away from where the kingdom's coming, <laughs> thy kingdom come on earth is coming to earth as it is in heaven. It's not leaving the earth and going to heaven. <laughs> and, 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 and you know, the scripture in Hebrew where Christ says, I have to leave. So, so he can come so that the comforter through the comforter you can go on and do greater things. That word for he in Greek is he, she, or they, it does not specify. Gotcha. So you're going to have words in the Greek where it doesn't really specify. And in hindsight, I believe that the Israelites of the, at that time, they knew that. So this is why in a lot of these passages, they are over explanatory because they know that if they're, if they don't take the time to draw on comparisons and, and use these analogies from things that you can reference that are illustrative, you might run off thinking the wrong thing. Gotcha. So I don't think it's gotcha. by chance that Christ said, you know, Hey, Reference the days of Noah to, to understand how, how Christ's coming is going to be. We know that in the days of Noah, unless we're talking about, unless, unless we are talking about uh, Noah being taken on a ride <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and 700,000 being left to the flood waters, then that, that would be the only explanation. However, 
we're we're going to we're going to prove all things because you're going to see in the uh, lost records today how there's no possible way that you could think that. Mm. Um, I just wanted to lay the foundation in the Bible in the 66 book Bible first. We're going to go to um, Second Edris 13. You're going to see a couple come up. You're going to see ESV. You're going to see KJV. Make sure you have the KJV account. In fact, you can just do Second Edges 13 and the whole chapter will come up because we're going to be in that chapter for a second. For anyone who has a copy of Second Edges, follow along. But if you don't, you can literally Google Second Edges KJV chapter 13. It'll come right up. This is going. This blew my mind when I first came, came to this. We're going to go to Second Edges 13. 16 and we're, and we're gonna we're gonna go we're gonna chop through this there's a couple things we need to highlight now while you while you're finding that here's the backdrop all right edris was a righteous man for those who have read edris before you know that god appeared to him in a burning bush and was like hey i'm the same god that appeared to your forefather moses in the burning bush um there were things that i gave him and told him to publish openly there were things that i told him that I told him to conceal in his generation. It wasn't time yet. So he told him to withhold it. Now, another thing that uh, Uriel, the archangel, told Edris in this conversation is, I'm the same angel that appeared before Daniel, and I'm the same one who gave him the dream in Daniel, and I'm going to give you more information concerning the same dream. So if you ever get a chance to go through and e either listen to the audio book of Edris, it is very insightful concerning the end times even more so than Revelations and some of these other books. And so now he's having a conversation with Edris, Uriel. So we're picking up at 16. For as I conceive in my understanding, woe, destruction, unto them that shall be left in those days, and much more woe unto them that are not left behind. So in other words, and we'll continue on, but other words, if you are around in these days and you survive it, you're not going to be impacted by it, but you're going to see a lot of chaos and destruction. You'll be protected through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for God is with me. If you are operating in the things of God, you're going to be protected from it, but you're going to endure it. The same way that knowing them, they were on the ark. They weren't affected by the flood waters directly, but they saw 700,000 men die in the flood. They witnessed that. You have to, you, you, you can't, you can't uh, discount the fact that some of their boys died in the flood. You can't discount that. And so, woe, woe to those who, who survived this, but even more destruction to those who are destroyed because of this. Now watch this, 17. For they that were not left were in heaviness. In other words, those who were destroyed, their hand was God's hand wasn't on them to protect them because they were the wicked ones. The same way that in Egypt, God's hand was only on the Israelites so that when the death angel fl flew over, it took the firstborn of the Egyptians. So there was heaviness as a result of God's hand of protection not being on them. Continuing on, this is 18. Now understand I the things that are laid up in the latter days. So now... Uh, uh, Edris said, oh, now I get what it is that I saw in a vision, which shall happen under them and to those that are left behind. Continuing on. Therefore are they come into great perils and many necessities, like as the dreams declare. So this is the dream that Daniel had. This is the dream that uh, he's having here. 20. Yet it is easier for him that is in danger to come into these things than to pass away as a cloud out of the world and not to see the things that happen in the last days. Because if you are taken during that time and God's hand of protection is not on you, the next thing you're going to see is judgment in front of the most high for all of those wicked things that were the result of you being taken. So in other <laughs> words, you would be best to be alive to see the destruction because if you die as a result of it, the next thing you're going to see is your judgment and it's not going to end well. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it is better. It is easier for you to go through seeing what happens in the earth and survive it than to be taken. Twenty one. The interpretation of the vision shall I show you. This is Uriel talking to Edris 
and I will open up you the thing that you have required. So in other words, Edris had asked for an understanding of things, right? Whereas you have spoken to them that are left behind, this is the interpretation. So this is for the people that are going to be left behind. What we're getting ready to read next, right? He that shall endure the peril in that time have kept himself. In other words, those that are alive to see these things have stayed close to God and have kept his charge and have kept obedient to the most high. And that's why they're alive to survive it because of their obedience, right? They that be fallen into danger are such as have works and faith toward the almighty. So if you were allowed to see these things and, and go through this, it's for a reason. Know this, therefore, that they which be left behind are more blessed than they that are dead. So now we see what taken means. It means to be dead. You were taken out like those in the days of the flood. They were taken mm -hmm. in the flood. They were killed. They're dead. They're no longer here. Right. So 25. This is the meaning of the vision. Whereas you saw a man coming up from the midst of the sea, the same is he whom God, the highest, have kept a great season. It's talking about Christ, which by his own self shall deliver his creature. So this is a man living in a time before Christ. And this is alluding to Christ is coming the second time, not even the first time. Near, right. And he shall order them that are left behind. So for those who are left in the earth. God is going to order their steps to see them through all of the despair and destruction that's coming. Hmm. Now, do you see why this book was taken out of the Bible in the, in the 1700s, right around the same time that the rapture doctrine was created? Now, do you see? Questions so far? We're almost there. Questions? Is this pretty crystal clear to you? Yeah, it's crystal clear, yeah. man. It's also uh, this is this is this is the meat of the text. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and so now you see why they took out Edris, which makes it very cl crystal clear. Let me show you one more thing, real quick. Go to Matthew uh, <laughs> Matthew twenty four thirteen, and now you'll have a clear understanding of what's being spoken here in Matthew twenty four thirteen. You have to keep in mind, Christ actually had access to Second Edris in his time. So Christ is going to be considering all of these records and prophecies up to his point, including second address. So Christ says in Matthew 24, 13, but he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. Now, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's reinforce this some more. We're going to first Thessalonians four and 16. That's a book you don't hear hear people uh, uh, pull up very often. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. All right. So now we're getting the backdrop that during that tribulation that we now know that you don't get beamed out of, <laughs> the dead are risen first. The, 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 the dead are addressed first. Now, if you die because of that flood or because I'm sorry, if you die because of the flood and in the New Testament, because your God's hand wasn't on you to protect you from the fire this time. You're being risen because judgment's coming. So keep that in mind. Right. 17. Then we which are alive and remain hmm, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. There's those that survived. There's those that endured to the end. There's a scripture in the New Testament that says, uh, you know, all will be righteous and all in the kingdom are righteous. And it's like, yeah, because all the wicked wicked ones were destroyed. And they're in the lake of fire. That's why there's no, there's nothing unrighteous left. Because the ones that were wicked were taken. Now, where a lot of this stuff might seem scary, let me give you let me give you the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Psalms ninety one and two, and it's crazy. We we grew up in churches and we didn't learn any of this. We didn't learn any of this. Even with just the sixty six book Bible, we didn't learn these things. 
It's like if, if you come up in one of these institutions and these are the, this is the spin that they're putting on things, then you're just basically reading the Bible through a lens that you were given. You're, now you're looking for something that's not there because that is the spin that you're given, right? This is why we're called to use scripture to reproof, not to know things one time, but to make sure constantly that we're dealing with the right things, right? So Psalms 91 and 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare, we talked about snare earlier, of the fowler and from Newsome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wing shall you trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day. Is this all starting to connect now? Nor for the pestilence that walketh in the darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come to you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord which is my refuge, even the most high, your habitation. There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. Now, I stated all that for a reason. I stated all that for a reason. I'm, I, I wanted to lay that backdrop before we continue in Edris, because it, it is kind of scary to think about with some of the stuff that's getting ready to be said. I wanted to lay that backdrop first for what we're getting ready to read. Okay, so this is 2nd Edris 1621. Behold, victuals shall be so good, cheap upon earth, that they shall think themselves to be in good case. And even then shall evils grow upon earth, sword, famine, and great confusion. 22. For many of them that dwell upon the earth shall perish of famine, and the other that escape the hunger shall the sword destroy. And the dead shall be cast out as dung, and there shall be no man to comfort them, for the earth shall be wasted, and the cities shall be cast down. There shall be no man left to till the earth and to sow it. The trees shall give fruit, and who shall gather them? So that one man shall desire to see another and to hear his voice. For a city there shall be ten left and two of the field which shall hide themselves in the thick groves and the clefts of the rocks. As in the orchard of olives upon every tree there are left three or four olives. Or as when the vineyard is gathered there are left some clusters of them that diligently seek through the vineyard. Even so, he's given an illustration here, even so in those days there shall be three or four left by them that search their houses with the sword, and the earth shall be laid waste, and the fields thereof shall wax old, and her ways and all her paths shall grow full of thorns, because no man shall travel there through. So in other words, when this thing goes down, according to this situation, ain't going to be a whole lot of humans left. So much to the, to, the, to the degree that you're probably going to have a hard time running into another person, right? Continuing on, 33. The virgins shall mourn, having no bridegrooms. The women shall mourn, having no husbands. Their daughters shall mourn, having no helpers. In the war shall their bridegrooms be destroyed, and their husbands shall perish of famine. Hear now these things, and understand you the servants of the Lord. Now. This ain't the cutesy, all you have to do is believe everyone gets in the kingdom version that we hear and that we have heard growing up. It's probably not as marketable, but it was never supposed to be because we weren't don't, we weren't given this to sell tickets to heaven. We were given this to be warned that only a few would actually accept these things, like in the days of Noah. And just to kind of give you a, a honest snapshot, 700,000 died in the flood. Eight survived. 700,000 died in the flood. Eight survived. 700,000 were taken. So the scary part is not 
whether you the odds fit you or not. The scary part is when he comes, are you under his protection to be protected? That that is the scary question. Because if the answer is no, we have plenty of parables that you can read in the New Testament now where Christ is saying, Don't let the master come home and the servants have don't have the house in order. Don't go out there and you ain't bring all the oil for your lamp. You out there in the darkness. This is what Christ is talking about by saying you better be prepared and you better have all your affairs in order because of what's coming. And I'm not so confident that we won't live long enough to see this. That's the, the more disturbing part. When you read Ezekiel 38 and 39, there is some indication that with what's happening with Russia and China, that scripture says that Russia and China are going to join forces to ensure that the land of Israel and the daughter of Babylon, which is where we're living, do not interfere with the Persians, which is the modern day Turks in Syria, judging the land of Israel. Now, I don't know if that means that they're going to neutralize us or we just don't get involved. But according to Edris and Ezekiel 30 and 39, the land of Israel is going to be destroyed because of who's in that land right now. Hey, Mario. Um, yeah. Hey, so a few things growing up in church, one of the things going back to like the the rapture and and even kind of what you're talking about right, right now about Israel being destroyed. Mm -hmm. One of the things I grew up in that back on the church, I told you that they were they, they say we're not Jews, but we're we're uh, Christians returning to our Hebraic roots. Remember, I was telling you about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that he was saying was one of the ways, you know, the rapture was near was if Israel were to come under attack. And that would be a sign that the rapture was coming. That's when they used to say stuff like, you better practice your rapture jump because the Lord is coming. And I used to be like, man, this was before I was studying. I was yeah. like, this don't make no sense. Some ain't, some ain't connecting. It, well, it ain't. To, to, to his point, he had the right concept. He had the wrong titling. You mm -hmm. like according to Edris, if you were to read Edris 13 through 17, it tells you that when Israel is laid waste to flee and get out of the cities because the fiery arrows are coming here next. Yeah. Is what it says. And so I tell anyone when Israel is destroyed, it's not that the rapture is coming is that tribulation has started. And so here's the danger of operating in the rapture. For many people, not all. Here's the here's the issue with it. If you're the type of person that believes, oh, well, I'm going to be raptured up before I'm presented with the mark of the beast. If you believe that and that's a lie, then you might take the mark of the beast thinking it's not the mark of the beast because you believe you would have been raptured up first. Mm. When in actuality, you're going to be here to see it. And here's the interesting part. My mother died when I was 12, but there was one thing my mom pressed me on. And my mom died believing in the rapture. She was the one who sat me down to watch the, the Left Behind movies and all that. But interestingly enough, my mother pressed me, don't you ever take that mark. And, and as an adult in hindsight, I'm like, dang, mom, you think I was going to be raptured up? You thought I was going to be here left? But whatever the situation, spiritually, it was pressed upon her to teach me whether you're taken or not, don't you ever take no mark in your forehead or your your hand under any circumstance. Your fate is pretty much sealed if you do that. She said, under no circumstance, you better put your faith in the most high that he's going to give you a way out of that. Because if you take that mark, you're done. You're sealed. Your fate is sealed. And my mom pressed that. I was seven, eight years old when she pressed that. So I will say to you, knowing what scripture says now and the fact that if we are not here, our children or grandchildren will be here to see this, Teach them, teach them that if they are in that generation that sees this, don't take that mark under any circumstance and place your faith where your faith should have always been anyway, which in we don't we don't provide for ourselves. We are facilitators of the most highest provision, the same way God brought Israel or br brought his elect through the flood, the same way he brought them through the Dead Sea during our time in Egypt, the same way he has delivered us out of seven captivities. His track record is impeccable. Put your faith where your faith need to be. Do not put your faith in your fear 
and in the provision of man to save you up out of it. You are walking into a burning house. Questions or concerns before we move into this immac immaculate uh, deception? Yeah, one Please last start. thing. Oh, my bad. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Jasher, going back to Jasher, when it talks about the flood. So we was talking about earlier in scripture how he was saying that, yeah, it's going to be terrifying. It's going to be worse for those who are taken away. But it's also still going to be scary for those who are here, but he will provide for us. And contextually proven when it says, when it said, it will also be like in the days of Noah. If you read Jasher, when it talks about Noah, there's a lot of context to the, that it gives to their experience on the boat that it doesn't give in Genesis. So in terms of like, they had, they, there were times where they thought they were going to die on the boat. Yeah. Yep. There were times where like the boat, they was like terrified because it was we I guess we just growing up hearing about the Noah, Noah and the Ark, we just kind of associated like, oh, there was this smooth ride and they were cool. But in Jasher, it actually talks about how they were tossed like backwards and forwards and they thought we're going to die on this boat. It was still scary, a scary experience, but yet God provided and he guided them to safety. Yep. Yep. Thank you for the context that 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 adds greatly. I appreciate it, Don. And it's yeah. true. Like they said, the waters rose by 18 cubits above the highest mountain. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what kind of rain or what kind of floodgates in the earth they have to open to allow that much water to flood. That's a lot of water. It was both. It does. Joshua says that the, yeah. the 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 torrents underground are the the uh, these. I guess if you want to call them caves opened up underground it actually says that happened and water skirted up from underneath the ground first before it started raining which is funny because then that that puts a whole nother connotation on this water being deep down in the globe enough of it to fill up the earth but another conversation for another day we're not doing that today <laughs> <laughs> we're not doing it today what you got to be honest <laughs> no, nah, I was I was just going to ask you if you've ever heard of this pastor here in Garland, Texas. He passed away like maybe a couple years ago. Um, his name was Irv Irvin Baxter. And he used to teach on like end time prophecy where he pretty much talked about how each uh, nation that was around in the end time is described by an animal in the Bible. It is. And, yep, it is. And there is a war that's coming that's going to kill like a third of mankind. And then after that war is when the tribulation kind of like starts. But he was a pre he was a pre rapture uh, uh, pastor. So so he might be right, but he might be right. And see the, the 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 issue or the what we do oftentimes is we say, hey, a person has this piece of it wrong, so they got the whole thing wrong. No, God winks at your ignorance so he can use you in your season, even if it's even if everything is not for that generation. So even with my with my mom gave me an ignorance, I was still able to take the piece that that is true and be able to build upon it. So I do when we get off, I do want you to text me his uh, name because I want to look into that, because here's the funny thing. I'm certain this man didn't read Enoch, but in Enoch, Enoch has a whole dream where he is literally given in this dream. Uh, an account from the beginning of Adam all the way to the end of the last age. And in this dream, animals are assigned to different bloodlines in the earth. And it's like, and the elephant does this to this animal. And then the, and then the elephant and the sheep, they do this. And if you can plug and play the, the bloodlines with the animals, you literally have a roadmap as to how this thing is going to plan, pan out. And now that you say that, I'm going to go back and start trying to decipher that. Yeah, because it was like, you know, like a lot of our countries are symbolized by animals. Yeah. So in the Bible, there talk there talks about a leopard. The the leopard represents in the countries is like Germ. I think it was like Germany or something like that. Their symbol is like a leopard, the hmm. great bear, which hmm. is of course Russia. Mm -hmm. And then like um it talks about the eagle swooping up Israel and taking her to a a, a safe haven, America. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like yep, yep. With, yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, 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 we gonna have a conversation about that offline because that's something that Justin and I was looking at in 2020 and I got away from it. But I, I that's on my like thumbtack to do list to actually go through <laughs> that dream and plug and play the nations because I've been studying genealogies for the last three years and I kind of have a good fix on who's who in the earth. 
because really only only um Shem's children move around a lot. J. Feffenham don't really move nowhere. So if you know where J. Feffenham was several thousand years ago, th- they are pretty much in the same place. It's Shem that you have to kind of pay attention because of, of course, the Israelites and then Edom's tribes and all that. There's a lot of movement. So, yeah, remind me on that because I do want to take a look at that. Um, any other thoughts or questions before we move to to the the most um, interesting of these, which is the Immaculate Deception? All right. So, last but not least, Second Samuel seven and twelve. This is during the time of David. This is a prophecy given to David, Samuel, obviously, concerning the coming of Christ. Right. Second Samuel seven and twelve. And when your days be full, David, and you shall sleep with your fathers, I will set up your seed. Remember this. Your seed after you, which shall proceed out of your bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. So this is very specific. And you'll find that any time the Most High gives a prophecy, it's very specific. It's very deliberate. The wording is very specific. There's nothing by chance. And things that are repeated are important. So David's being told it's going to be your seed. And just in case you're confused about which seed is, it's coming out of your bowels. It's going to be of your foliage, of your bloodline, of your seed. Men have seeds. Women add increase and expand that seed to be a child. But the seed is given by the men, right? Land foundation. Go to Romans 1.1. And this is fresh for you, Deonis, because we just talked about this. <laughs> so I, already know why you, I already know why you're chuckling. We're going to read Romans 1.1. One, one, one. Through one three, this is the beginning of the book of Romans. Paul, we know Paul's one of Paul's writings. Paul, a servant of Yeshua Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore before his prophets in the holy scriptures. Three, concerning his son Yeshua Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Does it say according to the Holy Spirit? Does it say according to some immaculate conception? Or does it say according according to the flesh? Does scripture contradict scripture? Anyway. Nope. Not. Nah. All right. Let, let, now, so we got two. We got the Old Testament. A prophecy was given to David through Samuel concerning Christ coming through his seed we have a witnessing scripture in Romans that said, according to the flesh, through the seed of David. I'm going to show you all something real quick, just in case it's not crystal clear already. I'm going to read the scripture again. This is uh, Romans 1.3. Concerning his son, Yeshua Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. What is seed in the Greek? What is that word up there? Sperm. Sperm. Okay. I just I just wanted to I wanted to be crystal clear what we're talking about here. Right? Prove all things with scripture, right? All right, so for anyone who's read the beginning of Matthew and you and you were called to read it out loud, you probably stumbled through about twenty names <laughs> between Matthew one one and one sixteen. Cause these Israelite names be a little little, you know, a little different to us. It ain't like some of the names we done came up with on our own. But what are, the, what are these names here? We just out here repping family members just because? Is that, is that what it is? What do what these names represent? All right. Let's read Matthew 1. 1. The book of the generation of Yeshua Christ. The book of the generation of Yeshua Christ. The son of David. The son of Abraham. And as you skim through these names, I'm not about to butcher these names right now. But if we fast forward all the way down to the end of the bloodlines that we're going through here to Matthew 1 16, we end up at Jacob, who begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Yeshua, who is called the anointed one, a.k.a. Christ. Right. So. Recap in the book, of, in the book of Samuel, prophecies given to David. 
you're going to have a, there's going to be a descendant out of your bloodline, out of your seed, out of your sperm, or out of your loin that eventually will, will come to the earth to, to save the righteous of your offspring and, and, and basically issue the world an opportunity for salvation, right? You go to the New Testament, the book of Romans starts telling us, hey, this was done according to the flesh. Now you have Matthew proving the flesh that it was according to through all the bloodlines to prove and confirm this. Out of the book of the generations from David to Christ. So then some will make the argument, well, well, Mario, a vir what about the virgin thing? It said that Christ would be born of a virgin. Okay, let's take a look at that. I'm, I was you know, we're not going to run from it. Let's go to Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. So according to coming of Christ, we would have a, a sign to be able to recognize this. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. We know Emmanuel means God is with us, right? So we have a sign in the earth. The sign is going to be that we should be able to recognize the son of God because the son of God is going to come from a virgin, right? Let's look at that word virgin. Let's look at the word virgin in the Strong's 714. Virgin in that passage, it's also used in Genesis 24 and 43. Virgin, young woman of marriageable age, maid or newly wed. Question. In the Old Testament, how, how was a marriage sealed? Through sexual intercourse. Oh, okay. So either this word that is translated virgin doesn't mean sexual intercourse or the, the standard by which you get married has changed. Because this word says young woman of marriageable age, maid or newlywed. Now I want to show you something else. And we're, we're going to come back to this word, but I want to show you something else. <clears throat> and this is why it's important to read things in, um, to look up things in the original language so that you know exactly what's being addressed. You can't assume that just because it's something in English, that is the exact same concept in Hebrew, right? So this is the version that you're familiar with. This is Genesis 24 and 16. And the damsel was very fair to look upon a virgin. Neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. So this concept means that the woman hasn't slept with anyone. But this is not the concept being used in that passage. <coughs> This is a different construct. And as you see, Bethala, I'm, I'm not saying it in the Yiddish, I'm saying it in the ancient, Bethala, that is that concept. This word can either mean of marriageable age, a maid, or newly married, meaning you've had sex if you've been married. So what you'll find is the, the term Alma in Hebrew denotes maiden. Or a woman who is of an age where now she has a period, she's able to produce a child, and her body has not gone through the process of having its firstborn yet. Once she has her firstborn, according to this understanding of the word, she is no longer a maiden. So I wanted to lay that backdrop because we're told, well, there's no way that Christ could be born of Joseph because it says virgin. Well, hold up. We're not talking about virgin. We're talking about maiden. It's a different concept, right? Prior to the Talmudic law being established, according to what God established in the beginning, you and your wife or you and your husband, you have a, you have a daughter. She don't leave the house until she's married. She's under protection. This whole rape culture thing that we hear about where women are out here and, you know, they're, well, they're unprotected. Because in the old days, it's not oppressive to have your daughter at home protected until she is then safely handed to her husband to protect her. A woman's not supposed to ever be uncovered, period. And I don't mean uncovered just literally. I mean figuratively uncovered as well. She's never supposed to be in a situation where she's unprotected. You don't ever hear about these Chinese and Indian people letting their daughters walk in the streets by themselves. There's always a bunch of them or they have their, their sons protecting them. The, they understand 
what we have forgotten, which is your daughters are supposed to be protected because they are the weaker vessel. That's how we honor them. We keep the, we keep our wives and daughters under protection until they until our daughters are handed off into their rightful suitor to be able to take over that process. Right. So that's the framing in that time period. The other thing that's the framing in, in ancient times was families were coming together. And what I mean by that is a decision had to be made between the fathers of both households. Now, it doesn't mean that the fathers made a decision without counsel of their wife. Like I, if you talk to anyone from the Middle East, they'll tell you. Yeah, my mom and dad talked about it. And they like I have a friend. She's from Turkey. She her parents had a very traditional way of presenting her her options for marriage. That's another misconception. We're taught, oh, they don't have a choice. Yes, they do. The choice is made within within a safe parameter of options. And so, for the example of my, my friend from Turkey, she was presented three three options by her father and mother who the mom made sure that the, the guys were cute according to what she thought her, do her daughter would like. And the dad made sure that they were suitable as far as protectors and providers. Man and woman coming together. You have two set of eyes in order to make sure what is for your child is suitable for because you love your children. Why, why would you send your children out here to make that decision blindly? That is a, that is a part of the curse that we don't talk about. It's a form of generational jealousy to send your kids out here in the world to make this life, lifelong, life altering decisions. And you don't have a hand in it. We're the only people that do that. We're the only people in ignorance that still do that. Us and the Europeans, the rest of the world doesn't do that. And so it was, it's an important thing. And so the fathers would come together. They would, uh, you know, there was a vetting process. A decision was made. If the, if the son and daughters checked off, whether we're talking ancient times or now, then there's an agreement. Once there's an agreement made between the families, the only thing that's required, according to God, is consummation. And, I, and where I'm not saying that having a ceremony and all that's evil, I'm not saying that. I'm saying the only thing that God cared about was that there was an agreement between families and they consummated that marriage. And they were they were uh, untouched on both sides. They were virgins. That is the most ideal situation that, that we are laboring to restore in the earth. Now, what happened between the ancient time and the time that Christ was born into, enter Talmudic law, enter all these extra laws and traditions and things and requirements that they anchored to the Mosaic law, that if you didn't do these additional things that they came up with, they were trying to judge you according to the, the, uh, the statutes of Moses, according to these things that they added, right? And so enter the story of Christ being born. Now, here's something that is key. And here's something that's not, not uh, regularly taught. The account of Luke in the original New Testament comes before Matthew. Why is this important? Because the timeline of Luke and the timeline of Matthew are different timelines. They are similar, but they're not identical. And we're going to prove that today. So real quick recap. We know now that version does not mean you haven't had sex. We know that. We know that the t there are two or three concepts in the Old Testament that are translated into English version. We know that the one that was prophesied concerning Christ meant maiden, meaning a woman who had not bare her first child yet. Whether she had had intercourse or not, whether she was married or not. We know that, right? Luke. 126 is where we are. We know that the book of Luke comes before the book of Matthew. We're getting ready to prove that. And remember the concept of first coming to an agreement, families, then taking the wife through consummation. Then keeping in mind that what was added between the first and second thing was this additional step, Talmudic law. There's an agreement, mosaic. Now the families have to come together in this ceremony in, a, in this party-like situation with the chamber in the back, that's Talmudic. That's the Talmudic law. That, that's not Mosaic. Then the consummation happens. That is Mosaic. So it was agreement of families, consummation. Then because of Talmudic law, it became the espousing, the coming together in the ceremony, Talmudic law, then the, then the consummation. The first one God accepted. The second one men came up with. 
Keep that in mind because that's about to come forward here. Luke 126. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin. So a woman who has not had her first child yet. Keep that in mind. She is of age, though, to be married, but she hasn't had her first child yet. Keep that in mind. To a virgin. A spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. So we know, again, Joseph came from the bloodline of David. We've already proven that. We know she was of marriageable age, but she hadn't bare her first child yet. We know she hadn't had sex at that point because according to that tradition, that only happens to seal the marriage. So this is the timeline we're looking at for Luke. This is agreement was made. She hadn't had sex yet, right? But there's an agreement. Keep that in mind. This is the timeline of Luke. Continuing on. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall call his name Yeshua. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob, which we know is the bloodline of Jacob, of the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be seeing I know not a man? So this is before she laid with Joseph. Are you following me so far? Are you following me so far? We're going to continue on in this. And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. And the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore, also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of God. So this is the rationale they give. See, the Holy Spirit gave her a child. But we're reading the Luke account. Watch when we go to Matthew, why they put Matthew first. Because if you read the Matthew account, you're going to be given a different impression, not understanding that not only is there a different timeline in this, but that book came afterwards for those who had already read Luke first. So we're reading it in its proper order so that you understand the proper timeline and context. Questions so far? And keep in mind, according to scripture, we can go there to prove this. John was, was conceived of the Holy Spirit as well. So why wasn't John an immaculate conception? Something to think about, right? So, so we're seeing so far that scripture is not contradicting scripture. And we're seeing very clearly, they constantly repeat of his father's bloodline. They're constantly repeating that. Why? For no reason. We're tearing down bad doctrine one, one scripture at a time, right? Let's go to the Matthew account. We're going to go to Matthew 119. Now, of course, we know Matthew first started off telling you the genealogies. It says this is the book of the generations from David to, to Christ, right? Matthew 119. Now, remember I said it's a different timeline. Recap real quick. We know that the timeline of Luke was there was an agreement made. The families hadn't come together yet. She hadn't laid with Joseph yet. So she's asking the angel, how am I going to have a child? I ain't even laid with nobody yet. Right? Agreement was made. They were a spouse. The families hadn't come together. She hadn't laid with Joseph. Keep that in mind. 118. I'm sorry. Now, the birth of Yeshua Christ was on this wise. When as his mother, Mary, was a spouse to Joseph. So this is before this is they were the agreement was made, was a spouse to Joseph. Before they came together. So this is now hold on. The agreement was made. The families, according to the Talmudic tradition, had not come together yet. But remember, we said, according to God, as long as an agreement is made, consummation is the only other thing that's required, according to God's account of this. Them coming together in the ceremony according to the Talmudic traditions, God don't care nothing about that. That was something, and it's not to say that there was anything wrong with that, 
But the Talmudic law in that time made you not coming together in that order according to what they added punishable by death. Keep that in mind, right? So now the birth of Yeshaya was on this wise, meaning was the result of in this way, referring to what precedes or follows. So Christ came as a result of this chain of events. It's, it's, it seems like it's kind of like in Genesis. I had a debate with a guy years ago one time because he was trying to say there, there were men that walked the earth before Adam. And he, because the scripture, and he actually ended up catching it himself, but he was like, the scripture talks about how God created man. And then later on, it talks about how he then created Adam. But yeah. what it was doing was it was giving an overview. It was basically saying, yeah, God created man and women and da, 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 da. And then it, then later on, the scripture says, now let's give you a breakdown of that. God created Adam. So yeah. it's like, saying, like, hey, here's everything that happened. Now let me get into the details of the structure of how that actually happened. Exactly. Exactly. Now the birth of Yeshua was on the wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now, watch this. Before they enacted the traditions according to the Talmudic law, she was pregnant. The man was concerned because he knew that laying with this woman before the families came together, according to the Talmudic traditions of that time, they were going to try to make an example of Mary. So this is after the agreement was made, but before that Talmudic tradition had occurred, meaning she had to lay with the man. And this and this saying that she was found of child of the Holy Spirit is inferring that it was it was due to righteous instruction. And we're getting ready to prove that. Je then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, you son of David, fear not to take unto Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, of which being interpreted as God is with us. So what we will hear is, see, Christ was born through Mary. There were no men involved. The Holy Spirit impregnated her. Bam, here comes Christ, right? Then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. And so he reasoned in himself, but he went ahead and did what the Most High instructed him to do. Then it says, and he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn. And he called his name Yeshua. So we have two possible scenarios here. We have the scenario where we have the Immaculate Conception, where we basically are saying that Romans 1, 1 through 3, throw that out. Throw away the fact that version doesn't mean the, the con construct of maiden in Isaiah 7, 14 is a different concept of version altogether. Throw that out. <clears throat> Throw out the fact that the book of Luke comes before the book of Matthew. Throw out the fact that you have an entire genealogy from in Matthew 1, 1 through 1, 16 from David to Joseph showing that that Christ came through that bloodline. Throw out the fact that seed actually means literally seed or sperma. Throw all that out. It's the Immaculate Conception. Or does scripture consist all throughout? And our scripture has been twisted to paint a different narrative. Which one? <laughs> because when you go down the path of realizing where the virgin birth came from, then you start to see where Christmas and Easter come from. Because the story of a woman bearing a child without a man is actually the story of Semiramis' birthing Tammuz without Nimrod. It is Babylonian occultism injected into the Bible. When you go down that road, you realize, oh, the reason we celebrate Easter in the spring and the reason it's associated with Astaroth, the same God that Solomon fell to, the reason it's associated with eggs and Easter bunnies is because it signifies fertility. But fertility of what? 
the birth of Tammuz without a man, which is the story in Babylon that we have been that has been Christianized, even though it's not in the Bible at all. And in Babylon, Semiramis laid an egg in the spring. You fast forward eight months. Her son is born December 25th, winter solstice, Mother's Eve, Christmas, Saturnalia. Our Bible has been uh, has been Christianized through Babylonian occultism, and we don't even know it. This is why in Revelations, we're, uh, th there's a voice that says, come out of her, my people. Come out of the Babylonian occultism that has been ejected into your Bible. It's not even a part of your Bible. You have been given a mystery, occultic religion, and don't even realize it. This is why it's so dangerous. Questions? I guess, I guess, um, I mean, like we, we've already discussed this. I mean, and every time we talk about it, I'm just like floored, but, um, it was something else that you brought up, um, going back. I think it was Matthew 24. I just want to get the context. Sure. Go ahead. Um, when it says, then you but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of Yahuwah appeared unto him in a dream saying, Yosef, son of David, fear not to take unto you, uh, Miriam, your wife or your woman for that, which is conceived in her is of the Ruach HaKodesh. Like, oh, are you like, is that saying like, how can I say it? Like, I know what you're asking. Th this whole thing, this whole chain of events was inspired the same way the Holy Spirit inspires us in this day. It would be like if, um, I'll give you a modern day example of this. It would be like if, um, you know how I have dreams sometimes and I say the Holy Spirit gives me certain information. It would be like if I was given something in a dream and then I woke up contemplating about where it came from. Like I've had people that hit me in my inbox like, yeah, I had a thought that came to my mind and I didn't know where it came from. You contemplating like, is this, was this me? Or was this something else? And the angel was like, no, nah, that wasn't you. That was the Holy Spirit. This is of ah, God. This is of the Holy it. Spirit. So you're not, you're not bugging. You're not going crazy. You're not going to come under any condemnation. All of this was part of the plan from Jump Street. That is the context of this. Does, does, that, does that make sense? Perfect. Because, Perfect I mean, sense. think about it. If you and I were living in that time and you know that, like, man, if, I, if, if we jump off before... This Talmudic, us coming together in this party and going into the chamber and you bleeding on the sheet and me giving it to the priest. If we jump off before then, they're going to try to stone her, call her a whore, all these crazy things. And so he probably like, man, all this stuff going to happen to her. You know how the enemy works. Yeah, yeah. God's going to do this and that to you and so forth and so on. So he probably in his mind like, man, this, uh, this is not a good situation. And, and it was so much that the Holy Spirit like, yo, don't don't sweat that. Because that thought that came to your mind, it wasn't you anyway. And so I want to show you something real quick. We didn't go into this when we talked about it, to be honest, but I want to show all of you something because it also talks about the Holy Spirit when it concerns the birth of, of uh, or I'm sorry, of John. That's that's his cousin, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so Luke 1 15, if I'm not mistaken. Actually, let's go to 13. Luke 1 13, and we'll read down through 15. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And you shall have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. So was he born of the Holy Spirit? Or was this saying in the same context that all of this was intended of the Holy Spirit and all these things work working in constant? I need to see you. I need to see your um, you guys are commenting here. I'm sorry. Let me bring it up here so I can see. All spirits were created in the beginning through Mary and Joseph consummation or intercourse. The Holy Spirit sent Yeshua into the womb of Mary to eventually be born. Yeah. And so. To your point, like, think about this for a second. Now, we've spoken in past time about how the angels, which are spiritual, it's an abomination for them to lay with humans. Why God does not change and he doesn't 
<laughs> double dip. He doesn't make an instruction and then flip it. If the angels, which are spiritual, laying with humans is an abomination, then how would the Holy Spirit laying with a woman be any different? Number one, that's almost blast. That's really blaspheming the Holy Spirit to even infer that. Hey, but also the Holy Spirit is a feminine noun. Yeah. Which is even more weird. It would be. It'd be a woman laying with a woman to. Yeah, it, it's super weird. And, and, and that's why, like, anytime I go into, like, coming into any reading and any scripture that it looks like it might contradict, the first thing I'm thinking is, well, there's something in this verse that a word or something that I need to look up to make sense of it. Because if there's one thing that I know, I know that God's word does not contradict itself. So then there's something in this that I'm not seeing that I need to surface in order to properly divide it to understand how all of it consists together. You know what I'm saying? And so you can see, as you guys follow along, you can see how this could be twisted. You can see very easily how someone could say, ooh, we, ooh, we, want, we want to inject this deity worship into this Christian faith system through the Catholic Church. Ooh, let's, let's, let's make Matthew first and let's teach out of Matthew and don't really reference Luke like that because with Matthew... The languaging is such where we can paint that picture. And if we just keep saying it enough, people are just going to start believing it, not even going back to reference and reproof behind us. You follow? And mm -hmm. so when as a kid, I, I would have never thought to reproof these things. And but the implication is dangerous because it's like, number one. You would have to throw away scriptures. That's number one. Number two, you're inferring that the Holy Spirit is laying with a woman which is abominable when you, when you go down that road. And here's the most dangerous part of it all and why I believe that Satan has, has twisted it the way that he has. Here's the most dangerous part. How many people go around saying, you know, they call themselves Christians, but they, but they really project this idea that I can't be like Christ at all. Christ came in some deified fashion, unlike mankind. There's no way I can be like him. There's nothing that I can do. He has to do everything. I can't do anything because there's this mass separation by how Christ came and how I'm called to operate. The whole time Christ said, you will go on to do greater things. It doesn't say I, I did everything so you don't have to do anything. It said that through my example and through modeling that, if you're a Christian, then you're Christ-like. How are you Christ-like if, you, if you're saying that you can't be like Christ? And people are even afraid to say that. But the reality of the situation, Christ said, be you made perfect like our Father who are in heaven. If you love me, keep keep my commandments. If you love my father, keep his commandments. I did not come to do my own will. I came to do the will of my father. I came to give you an example of that which to follow in your own life. How is it that you're able to say in one breath, I'm a Christian, I'm Christ-like, but have the image of no power, which is what scripture warns us of. So the idea that, that Christ would come through some means that we didn't, that is how they're able to deify the son above the father. That's how they're able to suggest that you shouldn't read the Old Testament at all because it's old and outdated and Christ came with something different. It's not what scripture says. Christ said, if you didn't read the Old Testament, if you didn't believe what Moses wrote, how are you going to believe what, what I've come to do? For he wrote of me, John 5, 46 and 47. And so what they have done is managed to very subtly paint this picture of separation between you and Christ, where ultimately you're reading scriptures about Christ. And you leave church thinking, oh, well, he did everything. He's he's superhuman. I can't do what he did the whole time. Christ is like the fact that I came like you is indication of what you are capable of through modeling me, having come the same way that I did through a man and woman. And it actually voids like what he what he said, like I conquered the world. Like, how did you conquer the world? Through going through what you went through, through every aspect. Every aspect. I, I was born. I live the life of, of, you know, of cleanliness and this is how you do it. Yep. So, wow. Hey. Yeah. And so, dope. yeah. So, um, I wanted to, <laughs> I dragged my feet on this one for a long time. I was afraid to touch it. There was a, there was about four years where I was afraid to even accept it. Um, but what really put it into perspective for me was when I realized that the account of Luke, um, the timing was different. And then I was like, that's why they switched it. That's why they put so much emphasis on Matthew, but they carve out, they carve around it. 
Because no one reads the gene. No one even connects the fact that the genealogies at the beginning of Matthew are connecting the fact that there will be a bloodline from David to Joseph. But that's what's written. And they wrote it in there to prove that Christ came according to the prophecy. Christ said, I did not come to destroy the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill them. Case in point. Careful with trying to teach these. And I'm not saying not to. I'm just saying that there are a lot of. Um, there's a strong delusion. So there are a lot of people that they, that their their very fabric is predicated on the rapture. And on this idea that Christ can do things and you have no power and everything that Christ already did everything he was supposed to. There was a burning house. He made up. He cleared a path in the burning house for you to get up and walk out of it in the power that he he left you in authority. But you got people in the, in the burning house celebrate. He did it for us. You're going to sit right back down in the burning house and burn up. That's not I have one he, question. Yes, ma'am. I never really understood the overshadowing part in the scripture. Like when it says the Holy Spirit overshadowed. Let's look it up in the Strongs. Okay. Because it, 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 that is a word that I, I ask myself about too. It's not just you. Trust me. You only, okay. you only see it in the Bible twice. Um, okay, gotcha. You, you see it. I'm sorry. You see it five times in the Bible. Um, two times is in the Greek. Actually, all five are in the Greek. And so I'm looking at uh, Luke 135 overshadow, and it says to throw a shadow upon, to envelop in a shadow, to overshadow, to cast a shade upon, that is, to envelop in a haze of brilliance, figuratively to invest with pre-natural influence, overshadow. Then you have um, an axe. Acts 5.15, in so much that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least of the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Right. I'm just I'm reading contexts that this word is used in. So then when you go into the past tense version, which is in the Greek, the definition G 1982 to throw a shade upon to envelop in a shadow to overshadow, um, to cast a shade upon, that is, to envelop in a haze, brilliance, same thing. And so keep in mind, these are Israelites. So Israelites are going to use um, analogies and prepositions in order to convey a thought. They're going to use illustrations. So if they're, if they're saying overshadow, it's, it's literally a visual that represents something else. And so um, this is Matthew 7, 17, 5. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. That doesn't mean that the bright cloud jumped into the body. It, the, the, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So overshadow is not, we know it's not impregnation. We know it's not impregnating someone. Um, another scripture, this is Mark 9, 7. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them. And the voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. You have it again. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them. And they feared as they entered into the cloud. And so we two, four of these five scriptures is the most high overshadowing his son. There's one that is a different example, but in all of these situations, even the one where it says the Holy spirit will overshadow him. It's almost like God overseeing this process. And of course we know the Allah Haim is the father, son and Holy spirit. So it's like the Holy spirit, the, the mothering sort of nature of God is overseeing this process as it, as it runs its course. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh-huh. So just to recap, We've shown very clearly in Matthew 24, first and foremost, when it concerns the, the rapture, that those that are taken are those that are killed, like in the days of Noah, when they were taken in the flood. And it said that the coming of Christ will be like in the days of Noah. There will be two in a field. One shall be taken. One shall be left. Left. We know that in Edris, second Edris, in second Edris 14, it states that blessed are those who are left, even though they have to. Endure the tribulation, blessed are those that endure to the end. 
for those that are taken, that's not a good thing. And then when Christ comes back, he is, he is raising the dead first so that they can face their judgment. Because those that were taken who died as a result of God's hand not being on them during the time that the tribulation occurred, that God's hand wasn't on them because they were wicked. And we went into the fact that God's hand is going to be on his elect through all of those things. So even though they look scary and they and during that that uh, turmoil period, those things, you're going to see destruction and dismay. But just like in the days of Egypt, just like in the days of Noah. No harm will come to those who are God's elect, who are protected and under his protection. It's going to look scary, but God's going to give you a way through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for God is with us. The ones that God is not with, taken. And so we also went into tithing. We know very clearly that tithing is, it was food. We know that it was food or cattle. We know that it, it that. The instruction by God was to take the food or cattle into Jerusalem. And if the tenth of your cattle and food was too much, that God expected you to redeem it. Redeem 15 percent of it. Right. As opposed to 10. Taking it to the land of Jerusalem as the chosen land by the things that are pleasing to you, having been a a obedient servant to the most high and eat with your brethren Give it to the poor to eat with you. Give it to the Levites to eat with you. Has nothing to do with money. Has nothing to do with pastors. Because we don't have pastors that are Levites in this day and age. So we went into scriptures to prove all of that, right? And so um, I hope that with the backing scriptures today, you have a clearer understanding of why it is extremely important for us to study, to show ourselves approved, and to go behind ourselves Go behind our peers, go behind our ministry, and look at these things for ourselves. Somebody just asked what would tithing look like today. I think it was Raven. Was it was was it that? Ah, can't talk. Was it you, oh, Raven? Yeah, it was Raven. Um, oh, okay. Well, here's the thing. Will we see tithing today? See, the tithing, anything that God establishes and gives us as an instruction, it is given for the purpose that. It, it, it serves some function, right? So if we're talking about a time that uh, 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 Levites or Israel went into captivity, I'm pretty sure they weren't tithing when they were in captivity before. Consider, if they're in captivity and they're not able to worship their God, are they, are they tithing? We're still in the door of Babylon. We're not in Jerusalem. So unless we're talking about commuting to Israel, and searching out some Levites by which to teach to teach us, are we re are we really tithing? Now I'm not saying that we shouldn't give, because there's tithing for the purpose that tithing was established, and the separate scriptures tell us to give with an open heart. Those are not the same constructs. So I wouldn't even have a problem if I went to a church that's and there are churches out here who say, hey, scripture doesn't tell us to tithe. However. We are asking for donations in order to run our church. I would respect that. But if you're taking scripture to say, will a man rob God? And those scriptures are talking about you using scripture out of context to try to suck money out of people. I got a problem with you. If, if like I've had people offer to give me money. Um, and initially I turned it down. Now what I would probably do with it is store it um, in, in order to feed poor people or someone who, who's in need. I would probably put it in my cash app. And then when I go out to buy fast food, I buy an extra meal. And when I see somebody on the side of the road, God loves you. God still remembers you. Come back to him and give him the food, something to that to that effect. I wouldn't be out here buying a Bentley in, in, in a helicopter while my congregation is believing a lie concerning how scripture is being used. It's a money grab. And it's sad that it's being done. So I'm not I'm not out here telling folk that they shouldn't give with an open heart. And I made it clear earlier that if you are convicted of the Holy Spirit concerning giving, listen to your convictions where it concerns the Holy Spirit. For God's going to bless you, even if someone else has ill intention. But if you gave from an open heart, the Most High is going to recognize that and be able to account for that. I have one. Well, kind of. You know, I'm one who always hits you up by what I hear. And I'm not sure if it comes from the Holy Spirit or not. Sure. But it's like been scorching hot down here in Mobile. 
Mm-hmm. And like, um, I was a tither in church. You know, I told you that. And then I got left, the, you know, left the church. Mm-hmm. And so like, I've been trying to, I've been asking God for ways, like, what can I do to make up, which I'm glad you did break up this time. Because I literally this week was asking God, like, what can I do to replace the fact that I used to give a certain percentage of my check? Like, what could I do if I'm not doing that anymore? And so, like, I was sitting on the sofa and I heard, um, it's hot outside. Go feed my people. Because Mobile got a lot of homeless people downtown. Yeah. So I'm like, maybe that's what that meant. But now I'm getting clear. Yeah, that's probably, that's what it meant. Yeah. We, we, here's, here's the common theme throughout scripture. And this was actually, part of this was revealed to me this morning. As I was preparing this, God gave me something else. Israel was set apart to be a father of all the other nations. Now, if you black and you are starting to remember who you are as a, as a descendant of the children of Israel, we have all these gifts. The world always is emulating us. You know, we're the salt of the earth. We have all the flavor. Keep that in mind, right? If we are the father of all other nations and we were given the authority over them, from the perspective of a parent being an illustration to a child, then why wouldn't God give us the greatest blessings in order to use the blessings to be a bridge to be able to reach people outside of our own? Whether that is feeding the sick, for them to have an ear to hear, to bring them out of a destitute state in order to draw them to God, whether that be someone who is in illness, where God gives them the gift of being able to use herbs in order to heal them, in order to to be a, a, a bridging for ministry, saving lives in order to save lives, Justin. Um, you know, and so if we are a light to the world, we are a light to the world because of our example. What would it look like? How, how many of us have been kids and we turn on TV and we see a celebrity and we see the way they dress and the things that they have? And it, we're like, man, man, I want to be like that when I get older. Because we see the illustration and we want to model whatever we think can get us to that illustration. Where do you think that came from? That came from God using us in that way. The enemy has twisted that. But if you ever read Leviticus, uh, read Leviticus 25, you read Deuteronomy uh, 27, I believe it is. You see that God promised us all of that. Y'all are going to be lending to all the other nations. I'm going to give you enough that you can feed all the other people. I'm giving you all the tools that when people look at you, they're going to be like, man, how did you get in that position? I want to do whatever it takes to get to where you are. The whole time we got in that position because we were close to God. And what they're seeing is the product of that. That's why we that's why we were set apart to be a light to the world. That's why we're given these gifts and God didn't take them back. He, he didn't take those gifts because he's waiting for us to return with those gifts for the purpose he gave them to us. And that probably was the Holy Spirit telling you, you, you know, because here's, here's something I'm going to tell you. Here's how you know it's the Holy Spirit. It's going to line up with Scripture every time. Holy Spirit ain't going to never tell you nothing that, that don't line up with Scripture. If you're hearing something in your head telling you something contrary to Scripture, that ain't the Holy Spirit. That's a common spirit. It's an unclean spirit. Anytime the Holy Spirit speaks, you'll be able to go in the Bible and find it. And she's going to convict you to either operate in good works or to stray away from works that are, not, are, are void of function. Uh, and I said it that way on purpose because a lot of people think, oh, what's wrong with this? This ain't hurt nobody. If it's void of God's establishment, then what you doing it for? There are a whole lot of things out here people be doing that are void of of purpose, and they think that just because they don't hurt anybody, that God doesn't have a problem with it. If it's void of purpose, guess what? It's in the way of something that has purpose that you should be doing. I say this often, we're the, we're the generation that is laboring to reproof and unlearn a lot of these things, but learning lessons like this, we'll be teaching our kids the correct thing the first time. So they're just, they're never in a state where they are confused or, un, or spending a whole lot of time unlearning. We are a generation that we are correcting a lot of this foolishness um, that has been weaponized against us. And and I, I don't mean this in a malicious way, but half the reason that we are in this state, outside of the fact that our forefathers were disobedient, but as a result of that, you have a foolish people over us. And we're learning our own family history from a foolish people. 
they were never supposed to be in the way in the first place. That's the result of this curse. So now we're, we're dialing back and we're removing the buffer out of the way and we're dealing with God directly now for the first time in 400 plus years. So it is, despite what we're seeing in the world, this is a great time to be alive as a people because of what's being restored. And I'm, and I'm anxious and excited to see what our children will do with this information in their generation. Um, and just know that we are entering Jacob's trouble as a people. It's written in, in the New Testament. We are entering a time where because we are starting to wake up, there is going to be um, contention. There's going to be variance and strife in, in uh, uh, the nations looking to, in certain facets to come against us. However, there are rules to this. No one can touch you as the elect unless you put your unless you opt to put yourself in a space where that can occur. And I'll leave you guys with this today. This is a scripture, one of my favorite scriptures out of the Old Testament. Psalms 37, 25. This is David. I have been young and now I am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. So fear God and keep his commandments. Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. You doing that? Then you have the Holy Spirit as a guide. If you're keeping the commandments, you have a Holy Spirit as a guide. If you have the Holy Spirit as a guide, then you have someone to check and balance you, to convict you according to those things. Study to show yourself approved. Pray on a regular basis. Cover your family in scripture. Study amongst yourselves. Reproof everything. Don't be afraid to ask questions because there's a difference between asking God a question and questioning God. They're not the same thing. Truth takes care of itself. All you have to do is seek it. Seek it. Seek truth daily and apply it to your life so that you can be an example and you can walk in your appointment to be a light to all other people. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another Sabbath, another rest day, another opportunity to detach from this chaos in this world that we can spend time with your people and in your scripture and in your word to be reminded of who we are as a people, what we are called to do, who we are called to be, how we are called to be a light to the world and to those who may not be close to you. I ask that you continue to um, protect our families, protect our loved ones. I, I Pray that you continue to shine your patience on those who may currently be ignorant, um, that, that they are afforded the opportunity to turn from a lot of these wicked things before it's too late. I pray that you continue to equip us to be tools to be used for that purpose, that we can silently be a light to the world and draw people to your fold in order to make priests of all of those that were called for that to be the case. And I thank you for all of this. I thank you for this appointment. I thank you for bringing me into a space where I can be used in order to benefit your people. And I, and I pray that you continue to bless us and our generations that come out of us as we restore these things according to your appointment and according to prophecy. These things we pray and thank you for in the name of your, your son, Yeshua Mashiach, we pray. Amen.